All right, so we're learning how to multiply vectors together. In the past, we learned how to multiply a vector times a scalar, which just means we multiply a vector times a number. And we learned that when we take a vector and multiply by just a number, it just makes the arrow longer or shorter, but the orientation is the same. It doesn't change. So it is multiplication, but it's just basically stretching out or shrinking that arrow. Then we have the dot product here, which is the second way to multiply vectors. And then we have another way to multiply vectors we're going to learn after this called the cross product. And they're all important and they all have their own uses. So the dot product is when we take a vector and we multiply it by another vector and the result of that is just a number. That's why it's called the scalar product. In your book or your, uh, you know, your, your, your lecture, it, your professor might call it the scalar product of two vectors. That's because you take a vector, multiply it by a vector using the dot product and out comes a number, just a number. So the answer to a dot product problem might be five or the answer might be two. The, might, the answer might even be negative six, right? Because it's, those are all numbers. But later on, we're gonna learn about the cross product where you take a vector and multiply it by a vector in a totally different way. And the output of that is another vector. Remember, a vector has a strength, magnitude, but also a direction, it's a directional thing. That's what the cross product is for. So we have uses throughout physics and engineering and you know for all of these different uh, cases, and I'm gonna explain as we go through uh, the main use case, or at least one way, one important use case of the dot product. But just know that there's way more uses than what I'm going to talk about here. We just need to get that foundation. All right, so the thing you need to remember when you do a dot product, it's vector dotted with another vector, which means multiplied with another vector, out comes a scalar, which is a number, and later when we cross two vectors, that's another way of multiplying, vector cross with another, another vector, out pops a vector. So this one's called the scalar product, because we get a number. Later on when we do the cross product, can you guess what that's called? It's called the vector product, right? Because you, you get another uh, vector as the output there. All right, so what are we gonna talk about here? We, uh, first, I think what I wanna do is write down how to calculate the dot product. And um, then after that, we're going to kind of go and do some examples and prove it over there. All right, so let's talk about this thing called the dot product. Now, the thing I wanna talk about in the beginning before we get too far into this is for you to remember or for you to know that there's two ways to calculate the dot product. Both ways are gonna give you the same answer, but the, which method you use just depends on what you're given in your problem. Because remember, we can represent a vector as a magnitude and an angle, that's kind of the polar notation for a vector, and the other way is we can write it in unit vector notation, which are just x, y coordinates of the tip of the vector. Either way represents the vector, and so we can calculate uh, the dot product using two equivalent formula, but we're gonna get the same answer no matter what, and I'm actually gonna show you that as we go through this, we're gonna calculate it both ways. So if you are given the vector as a magnitude and an angle, if you're given this, we're gonna use this method over here. And if we're given it in terms of unit vectors, which another way to say that would be x, y, you know, Cartesian representation, we're gonna calculate the dot product a different way. In the beginning, you won't totally understand why I'm writing these things down, but as I get through it and explain the physical significance of what we're doing, you will understand why it's written the way that it is. Now, if you're given, if your vector is given to you as a magnitude, uh, if your two vectors are given to you as magnitude and angle, what you'll say is that vector A, whatever it is, dotted with vector B is gonna give you the following. Now, before I go any further, I'm putting this dot here. And in regular lower level math, it means multiplication, right? Three dot four means three times four. When we write A dot B, it does not just mean uh, uh, numerical multiplication like you learned a long time ago. When you write A dot B, where A and B are vectors, then this means the vector dot product. It means a very specific thing that we have to use what we're writing down here on the board. So when we say A dot B, what we're really saying is the magnitude of A multiplied by the magnitude of B. These are just numbers. The length of A and the length of B multiplied the cosine of the angle theta. However, it's important for you to know that this angle theta is the angle that is between vectors A and B, right? And I'm gonna draw a picture to show you in a second, but I'll just kind of put up here. This angle is the angle between A and B. You know, because these vectors in space, you know, may have one vector here and one vector here. There's an angle between them. That means how many degrees, literally, or how many radians, between one vector, one uh, vector uh, and the other, that is the angle that lies between those two vectors, and it's the cosine of that angle, right? 
So it's the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of an angle. Now, before we go any farther, let's think about what this means. When we take A dot B, what are we doing? We find the length of A. That's literally how long the vector is. That's a number. The length of B, the other vector, that's a number. And cosine of any angle is just a number. So it's number times number times number. What are you going to get? You're going to get a number. That's why it's a scalar product. It returns a number. You might get 5 back. You might get 10 back. You might get negative 3 back. But it's always going to be a number. You're not going to get a vector back. For that, we have something called the cross product we'll talk about later. And we use those for other kinds of problems. And you'll understand the physical significance of that later. I'm mentioning the cross product in passing because I want to, again, connect these two things. I want you to know that we study this, but to know that there's something coming forward that's slightly different and to try to draw a little connection, even though we're not, we're not going to study the cross product in this lesson at all, but for you to know that there is another way of multiplying these things that yields a vector output, we study that later. Here, it's number times number times number. That means the answer is a number. All right. So let me go ahead and just kind of circle this because this is sort of the most important thing on the board. This is what you will see in a textbook. Now I'm putting bars around A and B so that we don't get confused, so that we know this means the length of A and the length of B. But in most books, they don't really write the bars. They just say A times B times cosine theta. And you just know after a while that this A is the length of A, the length of B, cosine of theta. But I'm putting the bars here so there's no confusion and you know exactly what that, that is here. Now, this is if you're given the magnitude and the, and the angles of the vectors, you can do this because if you, if you know the magnitudes, you know these. And, you, and the angle here can, can be, uh, you can calculate this based on the angle of the vectors you have. But what if you were given uh, in uh, unit vector notation? And what I mean by that is what if I actually just tell you that vector A is equal to some component in the x direction, in the, uh, uh, which means component of x in the i direction, which is the x direction, right? Uh, and then uh, some component in the y direction in the j direction direction. What if a, what if vector b is then given to you as whoops as an x component of b in the i direction plus some y component of b in the j direction. Now, I'm putting vectors in in the xy plane here. There's a x component and a y component of each of these vectors, but just know that in general you can have you know, a z component, right? In, in general, vectors don't just point in a xy plane. They can point anywhere, x, y, z, right? Three dimensions. And in fact, there's even higher dimensions that we get into in much more advanced math. We don't want to get into that now, but you can have vectors with higher dimensionality than this. But this gets, what gets us through what we call classical physics, three dimensions, and then time is its own separate thing. Of course, Einstein unified time and space, and so Einstein, time plays a different role in more modern physics. But for now, just consider three dimensions of space, and then we have this thing called time always ticking kind of at the out, outside of everything else, okay, in classical physics. So this is an x component and a y component, and in general, there be a z component. We don't always have it for our problems, but in general, you can have a z component of, of uh of this guy right here, of the B ve uh, uh, vector. So if the um, vectors are given to you not as magnitude and angles, but as uh, x component, y component, z component of the tip of that arrow, and you construct the vectors as we've been doing in terms of a unit vector, then what we will learn later, uh, I will prove it to you later, but the following is true. We can take a dot b, and of course we can uh, calculate it this way, but if we have everything already in this uh, in this uh, format, then it's easier to calculate it as follows. What we do is we multiply the x components together, ax times bx. Then we multiply the y components together, ay, by. Then we multiply the z components together, az, bz, right? So literally, to find a dot b, you take the x components of both vectors and you multiply them. You take the y components of both vectors and you multiply them. You take the z components of both vectors and you multiply them, and then you add up all of these numbers. So number plus number plus number gives you number. So the dot product, again, just yields a number, a scalar. That's why it's called the scalar product if you read textbooks and other, other math books. Okay. So doesn't this look so complex, right? But this is just not so complex because this is just saying any vector written in unit vector notation will look like this, where a, x, y, and z are just numbers. Like this could be 3i plus 2j plus 6k. Same thing for the b vector. And all we do to, fit, to find the dot product is we multiply the x components, multiply the y's, multiply the z's, and add them all together. Now, it should not be obvious why this gives you the same answer as this. this unless you're a human computer, you wouldn't know why this works. 
But by the end of the lesson, at the, actually the very end of, the, of this lesson, the very last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to prove to you and show you why this works. I don't want you to think that things are magical. I don't want you to think, oh, I'll just memorize it. It'll be fine. I want you to know what you're doing. Otherwise, you won't, you, you'll won't. you always be uncomfortable and you won't even be able to place why you're uncomfortable, but it'll be because you don't know what you're doing. And that's what I'm trying to avoid. So I will prove this to you and show you that these two things are exactly the same in just a minute. But before we do that, I want to show you the physical significance of what the dot product is actually calculating. So what I want to do now is draw on the board what the physical significance of this is so you can have a mental image. And, you know, some people aren't so, they don't care about the mental image, but I, I would say that it's the, probably the most important thing I want to impart upon you, uh, to, to convey to you, is to have a mental image of what's happening. Because later on down the road, when you start applying the cross product, or the dot product and the cross product, to situations, you have to have a mental image of what you're doing. Otherwise, the physical significance of what you're doing, we'll have no, you'll have no tangible, you'll have no, tan you'll have no way to wrap your arms around it if you don't ever have a picture at this lowest level. So what we are doing, I'll say it in words, and then I'm going to draw pictures. What we are doing when we take one vector and we dot it with another vector, these vectors are randomly pointed in two different directions in space. What we're doing is we're seeing how much of one of the vector lies in the direction of the other vector. And however much of it lies in the direction of the other vector, the B vector call it, we take that amount and we multiply it times the B vector. So we're multiplying A and B. That We are multiplying vector A times B, but we're only multiplying the portion of vector A that lies along the, along the direction that vector B is pointing. I'm going to say that one more time because I want you to have it in your head as I draw the picture, okay? We are multiplying the vectors. Notice we are multiplying. A, uh, this is the length of A and the length of B. This could be like 5 meters per second for a velocity and 6 meters per second. We are multiplying them, but we're cutting it down by a cosine of an angle. The cosine of the angle is telling us how much, pretend my hands are vectors, right? It's telling me how much of this vector A lies in the direction that vector B is pointing. That's the amount that I'm multiplying times vector b. So it's not just the total length of the vectors that matters, it's how much of them lie in the same direction. And you might say, why do I care about that? Well, I'm going to show you physically uh, uh, an example from physics of why we do that, why it's so important. So just put that, we have to do one thing at a time. So hold your questions on what do we use it for, for just a second. Let me draw a situation on the board. All right, let's say that I have two situations. I have a vector a, pointed like this, and I have a vector B that's a little bit longer, but it's pointed in this direction. And this vector A and B, there is some angle that exists between them, I'm gonna call it theta, right? So to calculate the actual dot product, what do I do? I take the length of A, which is some number, multiply it by the length of B, but then I multiply by the cosine of this angle theta. But what does this angle theta mean like this? Let me show you. If you have this angle here and you have uh, these, these lines, the, these rays essentially like this, and notice they're connected tail to tail, right? They're connected tail, tail to tail. If I draw a dotted, line, a dotted line down here so that it's perpendicular, then this would form a right triangle, right? And if you notice, what is this side of the right triangle? This side of the right triangle is whatever the length of this arrow is. This is the hypotenuse here, A, and then it's multiplied by the cosine of this angle. The length of this side of the triangle is A times cosine of this angle because this is chopping it down and giving me this shadow projection. So if you take a flashlight or a torch and you hold it up here and you shine light down, then this arrow is going to cast a shadow uh, down onto this uh, other vector called B. And this uh, amount of the shadow that you see cast down here is exactly equal to A times cosine theta. Why? Because the cosine of any angle is equal to the adjacent side, which is this little length, divided by the hypotenuse. And so whenever you solve for this side, it's going to be the hypotenuse times uh, uh, the, the hypotenuse times the cosine of the angle, because cosine of the angle is adjacent divided by the hypotenuse, so just multiply. All right, so this side is A cosine theta. So then, if you consider this to be the case, and if you define this dot product, if you define the dot product as being the multiplication of the lengths of the vectors, however it's slightly modified, so that I'm taking vector B, and I'm multiplying by how much of vector A lies in the same direction of B, then what I'm going to have here is this, uh, this amount, so to speak, uh, that lies in the direction of B is going to be A times cosine of theta 
but then I'm gonna take this number and then I'm gonna multiply that by the entire vector B because I am multiplying the vectors, I'm just modifying it and I only care about how much of this A vector is in the same direction of B. So then I'm gonna multiply by B. Now here A and B are the magnitudes. I'm, I'm dropping the absolute value symbols because when I write A and B uh, without a vector arrowhead on top, these, means, these mean the length. So what this is is A times B times cosine theta. And that's exactly what we wrote down before. That's what we wrote down before. I just dropped the absolute value signs, and this is how you'll see it written in most textbooks. So when you, when you look at the dot product uh, formula, forevermore, I want you, when you see uh, A dot would be, it's A times B times cosine of theta, where theta is the angle between the vectors. I want you to replace in your mind with that formula with the following words. I'm multiplying the lengths of the vectors A and B, but I only care about the portion of the vectors that are aligned in the same direction. I'm gonna give you a physical example of why we do that in physics and engineering in just a minute. But just trust me that it's often important to multiply the amount of the vectors that are lined up together. So the only reason we have the cosine here is to cut this vector down and give me the portion of this vector in the direction of the other vector. So I have now two kind of like vectors lined up and I multiply the lengths together. This length times the B vector. That's what the dot product physically means. All right, but here I've drawn it as if I'm projecting A onto B in the B direction. So this is the portion of A that exists in the B direction and then multiplied by the B length. But I can redraw my picture and show you that the, thinking about it the other way uh, works as well. So I'm going to redraw the picture, I'll try to get the same situation, but of course it's not gonna be exact. I have A vector, I have B vector, and I have some angle theta between them. Okay, so here I've said, if you think about it as A dot B, that means the amount of the vector A that exists in the B direction, multiply those together. The amount of A that exists in the B direction then times the length of B. That's what the dot actually means. So if you just replace in your mind the word dot with when you read A dot B, you read it as A that lives in the direction of B, then multiplied by B. That's the way you write it, okay? So then if I, I'll go over here, what if I want to do the other, uh, the other way around? What if I want to say, instead of A dot B, what if I say, uh, what if I say B dotted with A? Then in my mind here, what I would be thinking is, okay, I'm going to cut the, I'm, I'm going to multiply them together, but I only care about how much of the B vector lies in the A direction. I'm gonna say that again. How much of the B vector lies in the A direction? And then whatever that is, I'm gonna then multiply by the A vector length, okay? And so what do I get from this? Well, much like this one, I was chopping it down to see how much lies along B. I can do the same thing here, but since this vector's shorter, what I do is I extend kind of the line of action there, and I see how much of a shadow this thing would project in this direction. See, if I shine a flashlight up from the bottom and cast a shadow on this vector, how much of it will exist in the A direction? That's what we call how much of the vector B lies in the A direction. How do we calculate that? Well, that's gonna be B times cosine of theta. Right? Make sure you understand that. You may have to turn your head upside down, but in this triangle, here's the 90 degree angle, here's the hypotenuse, and here's the angle. So if I take B, which is this hypotenuse, times the cosine of this angle, if you flip your head upside down, that's cutting it down to the adjacent side of this angle right here. So what you're doing is you're, when you say B cosine theta, you're figuring out how much of it exists in the A direction. Then I take that number and then I multiply it by the length of A. So just like I did here, it was A cosine theta times B, that's how much of the A vector lies in the B direction times the length of B, and we get this. Here is how much of the B vector lies in the A direction and then we're gonna multiply it by A. So I'm just multiplying the length of A times however much of this is in the A direction. But since it's all multiplied, you can just bring this over here and call it A times B times cosine of theta. And notice what we figured out without using any numbers. We figured out that when we take a vector dot product A dot B, we get length of A times the length of B times cosine of theta between them. But if we flip it around and do B dot A, we still get the same thing. Length of A times length of B times cosine of theta. You get the same answer because we say that these things are commutative. You know, when you um, multiply regular numbers, you know that three times five is 15. But you know that five times three is also 15. So they're commutative. You can flip the order of the operation and it doesn't matter. Also addition works the same way. One plus five is six and uh, five plus one is also six. So the order doesn't matter. It turns out that the vector dot product 
doesn't matter the order in which you dot into vectors. You're going to get a number, but the number you get is going to be the same number that you get over here. Now, why is that? We go back to our definition. If I'm doing a dot b, it's a times b times cosine theta, but if I do b dot a, then these will be flipped around, b times a times cosine theta, you get the same thing. And the same thing over here, because these are multiplied to give me this term, these are multiplied to give me this term, and these are multiplied to give me this term, that's a dot b. But if I flip it around and put this vector on and do b dot a, I'm still multiplying these and still multiplying these and still multiplying these, and I'm adding them. And so it doesn't matter the order that you multiply and add, you're still going to get the same thing. So a dot b is the same as b dot a. Now that's not true for the cross product. We're going to learn about the cross product later, but when you cross a vector two different ways, you actually get a different answer. But for this operation, you can see that you get the correct or the the, um, the same answer. All right. So my plan going forward, we've introduced what the dot product is, but it's it's probably still fuzzy because you haven't seen any numbers. We're going to do a very quick example. We're going to do it right now. After that, I'm going to write down and show you the physical significance of what we use the dot product for. Then we're going to solve another example, and then I'm going to prove to you why this method of calculating the dot product works the way it does, because a lot of uh, physics and even engineering books don't spell it out for you. You also learn this in calculus, and a lot of times it's not spelled out for you either. All right, so let's go and solve the problem. And the problem is very simple. It says vector A has a magnitude of 10 units, and vector B has a magnitude of 6 units. If the directions of the two vectors are, uh, are 60 degrees apart, find the scalar product of the two vectors. Now, when you see a problem or any test say find the scalar product, you know it means the dot product. The scalar product means the answer you get is a scalar, a number. And the dot product is what gives you that. If you see something else, like the vector product, that's a cross product. We cover that uh, in a later lesson. All right. Now, notice there's no coordinates or anything. It just tells you the length of vector A, the length of vector B, and it does tell you the angle between them. So if you want to, of course, you could draw a picture. I mean, you don't, you don't have to draw a picture for every single problem, but it's a, you know, it's a good idea. But let's try to calculate this without drawing a picture first, just to get some practice. Actually, let's do it down here, just so we can save board space. I've got a lot of stuff to cover in this lesson. What we have basically learned or been told from the problem is we have uh, vector A, and we've learned that the magnitude of that is 10 units, like 10 meters or whatever it is. And we learned that the magnitude of vector B is six units long, whatever it is, six meters per second. If we're talking about distance or velocity or magnetic field or whatever, these are the lengths of the, of the thing here. We don't, we're not told the angles uh, relative to the x-axis, but we are told that the angle between them is 60 degrees. All right, that's what we're told. So if we want to figure out what the dot product is, then we just say a dot b, and we go back to our definition. It's magnitude of a times magnitude of b times cosine of the angle between them. So magnitude of a, magnitude of b times cosine of the angle between them. But we're given the magnitude of a, we're given the magnitude of b, and we're told that the angle between these two vectors is 60 degrees, so it's cosine of 60 degrees, right? And so what we have here is, uh, I put b here, sorry about that magnitude, uh, so it's 10 times 6, it should be a 6 right here. So what we have here, this is uh, 10 times 6, which is 60, and the cosine of 60 is 1 half, and so what do we get? We get the vector a dotted with the vector b, uh, 1 half of 60 is 30, and that's the answer. So what physical significance does that, does that uh, have? Well, I haven't exactly told you what we use these things for yet, so it's a little bit fuzzy. But what you do know is that we can, well, let's draw a little sketch and we'll see if we can try to try to understand a little bit more about what it physically means. All right, what we know is that we have two vectors, one 10 and, and one six. So I'll just draw this one here. I'll call this vector B. And basically it's six units long. So I'll put a six there. We know the angle between A and B is about 60 degrees. So I'm gonna try to draw a 60 degree angle. And this one's longer because vector A is 10. So this is vector A and it's 10, 10 units long. Right? And we know that the angle between them is 60. All right? So if we just did the calculation as magnitude of A times magnitude of B, what it would be is 10 times 6, magnitude of A times magnitude of B. But it's modified by this. You can think of it as A times cosine theta uh, and then times B. Uh, in fact, I'll write that. Eh, I don't need to write that down. This is like A cosine theta or 10 times cosine of 60. You can think of it as drawing a little right triangle down right here. 
And what this side of the triangle is, is 10 times cosine of 60, which is, since this is one half, this is like five. And then the five times the six is 30. So what you basically are doing when you dot these two vectors is you're saying how much of this vector exists in the direction of the other vector. So this is how much of it exists in this direction. That's the same as shining a flashlight down. 10 times the cosine of this angle, that's this side of the triangle right here. That's, that's equal to five. That's the, the length or the shadow of how much of it exists in that direction. Then I take that five and I multiply by the other vector, which is six, and I get 30. So A dot B is telling me how much of A exists in the B direction, take that number, then multiply it by the length of B. So it's telling me how much of the vectors are lined up in the same direction, and I multiply those lengths together. So we know how to mathematically do it. It's a very simple problem, I know, but uh, we need to have a, f a, a functional understanding of what this stuff is used for. Now, I have a lot of choices because there's a lot of uses of the dot product. We use it just to give you a flavor. We use it in mechanics when things are moving around with work and forces. We use it in electromagnetism. You know, when you look at Maxwell's equations of electricity and magnetism, there's dot products all over the place because those are vectors. Those are vector fields and I don't want to get into electricity and magnetism right now, but, but it, often, it, it often works out that you need to figure out how much of one vector is in the direction of another one and a dot product is employed in those equations. But we need to focus on something everybody can understand. And so at this point, uh, I'm gonna introduce the concept of work to you. Now we're gonna do an entire lesson on work very soon, right? We're gonna have an entire lesson on it with lots of problems. So if you don't understand work very much, it's okay, we're gonna, we're gonna get to it. But I think it's a simple enough concept that most people can understand it, even, even cold, like we're gonna do it now, and it's the most used uh, uh, elementary way in which we use the dot product, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna learn about uh, work, if I can get to the proper page here. And we're gonna do a little review of work. Now, a lot of you may have seen this before, and if you have, that's awesome. And if you haven't, I think you can still get it. Now, when you study physics in the high school level or at the lower level, what they tell you is that if you have the, typically what they'll do is they'll say, here is some kind of massive object uh, here, it's a dot, and what I do is I apply some force, right? So I'm gonna put F and I'm gonna put a vector on top because a force is a, is a pushing or a pulling, you know, uh, 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 trying to move an object. That's what a force is, trying to a push or a pull on an object, okay? So if I push the object horizontally like this, after some period of time, it's gonna move. So I can probably uh, put a dot right over here horizontally and I can say that it's moved. Now the force, you could just say, is still acting the whole time. So as I move the dot from here to here, the force is still being applied the entire time. So it's like a little, it's like I'm running behind a bicycle and I'm pushing it and I'm always pushing it the whole time. Or a rocket engine is always pushing as the thing is moving. So the force vector is always there uh, and the object has moved. Now, how far did the object move? Well, if you look at the distance between the starting position of the dot and the ending position of the dot, you could say it's a distance d units in meters. So we're gonna learn about the units later. I don't care too much about the, the units uh, to get too uh, deep into it now because we haven't covered this in detail, but the force is in what we call a Newton and a distance we would uh, use the unit of meters. Now in a lower level you know, physics or you know, science class or whatever, what you would learn is that we can define this thing called the work. And the work is equal to the force done or force pushing on an object multiplied by the distance. So you just write as F times D. Right? And so for instance, if we know this thing moved 10 meters and we, moved, we, we knew that the force was like five newtons and we take 10 times five, five times 10, we get 50, right? And that's what you learn at a lower level. It's fine to learn that at a lower level. We all have to start with simpler problems. I mean, we all have to learn how to add before we can do calculus, okay? So the simplest case is when you have a, a force that's pushing an object in the direction it's moving. But you see, what they don't tell you when you, you learn this at a low level, force times distance, is that in order to use this equation, the force vector must be pushing in the same direction of motion of the object. Then the work is the force times the distance. And also, the force is a constant force. It doesn't change. Like, you don't push harder or softer. Everything is constant. And then when the, all of that is true, and you're pushing in the same direction of motion, just like I've drawn it here, then you say the work is equal to force times distance. Very simple. But let me ask you a question. What happens if I'm not pushing in the same direction of motion? What if I'm pushing up at an angle? 
What if I'm pushing down at an angle? Very common on a rocket. You have a rocket, the pointy part of the rocket's up here, the engines are at my elbow. And to steer this rocket, you have the engines that are moving. They literally move back and forth and they're steering this thing by pointing the exhaust. So of course, the rocket could be flying and if you want to steer, you got to tilt that rocket engine so it's not exactly pointed directly up through the rocket. It's, it's, it's tilted a little to steer the thing, right? So the force vector is no longer in exactly the same direction of motion as the thing, uh, as the thing is moving because you're trying to steer it, right? So it's very common to push something in a direction that's not in the direction of motion if you're trying to steer it, for instance, okay? So let's draw a picture of what that would look like. So what we go over here, is we say, all right, here's a more complicated situation. You still have dot number one and you still have dot number two. Well, it's, it's the same dot really, but they've mo it's moved over some distance. And what you do is you say, all right, it's moved through some distance like this. And these, this has some mass associated, this is some uh, mass in kilograms or in grams or whatever it is. Um, and in this case though, we're not gonna be pushing directly horizontally in the direction of motion of the object. Instead, we're gonna be pushing, let's call it down like this, at an angle. So what's gonna happen? If you imagine this thing being on the ground, if you imagine the, gro I mean, the ground being here, there's no ground here, of course it's gonna go this way. But what if there is ground here? I, I mean, just imagine it. If I put this, this, this uh, marker right here on the ground, the ground is now the sheet of paper, and I push at an angle, what's gonna happen? Well, it's still gonna roll. But a portion of my force, if you think about vector components, a portion of this force is acting horizontally and a portion of this force is acting straight up and down vertically. That's the components of this force. But you know that when I do that, uh, I'm still able to move the thing horizontally, right? Because a portion of it is pushing straight down into the ground. The other portion, the horizontal portion is what's pushing it sideways. So what we learn when we study force and, and work, which we're gonna learn later in a lot more detail, is that the actual uh, work done in this case is what we really want to do is we want to figure out, if I can get my bearings here, we want to figure out how much of this force vector actually exists in the horizontal direction. And so what we do is we just draw a little triangle right here, right triangle, and we say, all right, well, it's, if it's this component of the force that acts horizontally. And then there's a vertical component we don't care about because the work done on an object is equal to force times distance. But you have to know the amount of force acting in the direction of motion. And this black arrow is the amount of this force that's acting in the direction of motion. But what is this black arrow equal to? What is this black arrow equal to? It's a triangle, right? The hypotenuse is F, the force acting down. And then I have some angle right here. I'll call it angle theta. So you can think of it as force times cosine theta. So the magnitude of the force times the cosine of the angle chops it down and gives you the horizontal component. So the horizontal component of this force is the magnitude of the force, the total force acting obliquely multiplied by cosine theta. That cuts it down and gives me the shadow projection, which is the horizontal amount of the force. And then you say, well, I'll just apply the same rule over here. The force is equal, or the work is equal to force times distance. However, it's only the horizontal amount of the force, which is F cosine theta, that actually matters when calculating the work. This is the horizontal amount of the force. And then we multiply by the distance, the distance traveled. Right? So this is still force times distance, but the reason we have the cosine theta in there is to cut it down and make it the horizontal component. Then what you can say is because these are all multiplied together, you can just write this as F times D cosine theta. And since we know, we, we're kind of doing a little bit of shorthand notation because we know that this is the magnitude of the force and this is the magnitude of the distance. They're all positives here, so the magnitudes don't matter, but that's what we're basically doing. We're saying the magnitude of the force times the cosine of theta times the magnitude of the distance moved, this is what we say equal to work. But that's exactly what we said the dot product was. Vector A magnitude times vector B magnitude times the cosine of the angle between them. That's the dot product A dot B. So when we have the magnitude of the force vector times the magnitude of the displacement vector, because that D is a displacement, okay, the movement, times the cosine of the angle between them, because uh, the angle here between the horizontal and the force is the angle between the distance and the force there, then what we really are saying is that the work is not really equal to force times distance, the work is really equal to the vector F dotted by the vector D. And this is important enough that I'm gonna circle it. 
Now, when you read this equation, now that you know what a dot product is, you should have a little more insight. Instead of just saying it's F dotted with D, the force vector dotted with the distance vector, since you know what a dot product is, you should replace that mathematics in your mind with the following. Work is equal to force dotted with distance. That means that work is equal to the amount of the force vector that lies in the direction of the movement of the object. That amount of the force multiplied by the distance traveled, that is equal to the work done. Because the work done on an object doesn't matter, the amount of the force doesn't matter unless it's pushing in the direction the thing moves. Now you can agree or disagree with that, but that's the way physics defines the, the concept called work. We're gonna use work for a lot of things later on. We're gonna study in a lot greater detail later on and do a lot more problems. But in your mind, when you think, what is the dot product used for? That is what I want you to think of. Work is equal to force dotted with distance. All right, but just be aware, there's almost an infinite amount of uses beyond that. That's a physical thing that arises in nature that we need to calculate in order to solve problems, and it's the force vector dotted with the distance vector. So when you see the, the dot there, I need you to think, chop it down in the same direction as the other vector, multiply the lengths of those two things together. That's what the dot product is actually doing. So now that we have calculated a very simple example with the dot product, now that we have uh, drawn a picture to understand what it means, and then we give a physical example in physics of what it's used for, and there's many more uses beyond this, I've mentioned that many times, the next thing I need to do is give you a couple of special cases for the dot product, and then after that we're gonna solve a more involved example so you get practice with real numbers, and then I'm gonna prove to you this dot product over here and why it behaves the way it does at the very end, okay? so. I need to uh, talk to you about some very, very important special cases. All right, I want to talk to you about special cases, so I'm gonna write this down. Special cases. Don't worry, they're very easy to understand. Let me give you two different scenarios, and we're gonna talk about them. The first scenario is, I'm gonna give you a scenario when vector A, which I'm gonna put here as vector A, and vector B, which I'm gonna draw in red, are basically lined, lined up on top of each other in the same direction. Now, I can't draw them actually on top of each other or you wouldn't see anything. So I'm gonna put vector B in red. But they're literally on top of each other. So you have vector B and you have vector A. Effectively, the angle between them is zero. There is no angle between them. And then I'm gonna give you a, another special case where I have vector A pointed maybe like this and vector B is pointed something like vector, like this, something like this, vector B, where the angle between them uh, looks like I made this not perfect. Sorry about that. I'll try to draw a little better. I know I can't draw very well, but some things I need to get right. So I'm trying to draw a 90 degree angle here. Forgive me, it's not gonna be exact. You get the idea. So here is vector A and this is a 90 degree angle. So here is when the vectors are lined up in exactly the same direction already. So the angle between them is zero. And here the vectors are situated in such a way that the angle between them is 90 degrees. What do we have in the first case? Well, if I wanna take vector A dotted with vector B, right? Then I write it as A times B times cosine of theta. But remember, I'm, I'm doing shorthand here. Really, it's the, the length of A and the length of B, but I'm not putting the absolute values because after a while you start to know that it's A, B, cosine theta. It's the magnitudes of A, the magnitude of B times the cosine of the angle between them. But since the angle between them, what you have here, this is A times B cosine, what is the angle between them? It's zero degrees. And what is the cosine of zero degrees? It's just one. So what you get is A dotted with B is just equal to A times B, all right? So this is the case when the dot product is really the maximum it can possibly be. Because what you've done is you said the dot A dot B is you're saying it's the length of B, uh, the, the length of A multiplied by the length of B. And since there's no angle between them, there's no shadow, there's no cutting anything down in the other direction, they're already in the same direction. So this is the largest value the dot product can be is when the angle between them is zero. Now let's go and do the same thing over here. A dotted with B, right? A times B times cosine theta. But if these things have a 90 degree angle, it's gonna be A times B times cosine of 90 degrees. But what is the cosine of 90 degrees? Cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So in this case, you get A dotted with B is equal to zero times anything just makes the answer zero. So in this case, when the angle's 90 degrees, you get a dot product that's a minimum. 
So I need you to start thinking about what are the angles between these vectors, right? Now, the math is gonna take care of it, of course, but because we have, I don't wanna to get too far ahead of myself, but it's, it's useful to know that if the angle between two vectors is 90 degrees like this, the dot product has to be zero. Why? Because the definition of the dot product is how much of this vector A lies in the direction of B. Well, nothing lies in the direction of B, so there can be no dot product. The dot product would be zero. Because if you looked at our example over here, notice A cast a shadow in the B direction. We take that, we multiply by B. Same thing when we reverse the order. But if A and B are perpendicular, there is no shadow. There is no amount of A lying in the B direction. So the dot product is nothing, it's zero, right? If the uh, dot product, uh, if the angle between these two uh, vectors here is actually zero, then everything's already lined up, and then we have the maximum dot product. So maximum dot product, when the angle between them is zero, zero dot product, if the angle between them is 90 degrees. All right, and this would be the situation right here. If you had the force vector lined up with the distance vector, then the work is the maximum you can have. And if you had it 90 degrees, like pretend that this was a force and this was a direction of movement. If you actually applied a force perpendicular to the direction of motion, then the work done on the object would be zero because that force is not actually pushing the object. Something else must be pushing the object. If it's moving some other direction and the force is 90 degrees to it, then that particular force is not exerting any work on the object because it's literally pushing sideways and the object is moving. It must be moving for some other reason in that direction. So if this were a force and this were a displacement, uh, force dotted with distance, you would have a work of zero. Even if the thing moved, this force would not be uh, uh, contributing at all to the work there. All right, what we have to do next is we have to roll our sleeves up a little bit. Believe me, we're, we're getting there, we're, we're, we're making progress. But we have to get comfortable with using the dot product. So what I wanna do is I want to, to, to I think we've talked a lot about this definition of the dot product. We focused on this, the physical meaning of what it means, the shadow, the projection, all that stuff, that's what we've done. We need to transition ourselves to using this form of the dot product. This looks very foreign, but I need to show you that we get the same answer in both cases, and then after that, I'm gonna to prove to you why this equals this. So we're gonna tie that up at the end. So let's start to transition ourselves to understanding more about how to calculate it in, in this situation. So let me give you two vectors. Let me give you two vectors. All right, I'm gonna give you vector uh, A. I'm gonna give you that that vector is four I plus zero J. And I'm gonna give you that vector B uh, is equal to zero I plus three J. Zero I plus three J. And I wanna find the dot product. But you see, I don't know the magnitude of these uh, uh, I don't know the magnitude of these, uh, uh, well, at least I can find it, but I don't, it's not given to me in the problem, the magnitude and the angle. I'm given, it in a, I'm given the vector in a totally different way, the xy unit vector notation. So it's more natural to use the dot product as follows, which I've given to you so far without proof, but as follows. It's just a sub x times b sub x plus a sub y times b sub y plus a sub z times b sub z, which is the z components, if there are any, okay? And what we're gonna have is this is the x component of a, and this is the x component of b. So it's four times zero. So you just say that this is four times zero, right? And then you add to it this, this is zero times three. You take the y components and you multiply them together. And then the z components, but there is no z here and there is no z here, which means both are zero. So you have a zero right here. What do you get? Zero here, zero here, and zero here. So in this case, a dotted with b, is equal to zero, all right? Now, does this make sense? So we're gonna circle this as the answer, the dot product is zero. Does this make any sense? Let's go and draw a quick xy plane and see if this actually makes any sense at all. So here we'll draw a little xy plane. And we'll graph the first vector. The first vector is four, one, two, three, four. That's four and zero. So that means the arrow is pointed just like this. And then the other vector is zero comma three. So we'll have one, two, three. Three goes up here and it goes up like this. So what we have here is, this is the B vector. And this one here is the A vector. Now, these, look at the way it's all lined up. It looks like the A vector is completely on the X axis and the, and the B vector is completely on the Y axis. So we know the angle between them is zero. So we know that if we apply the other definition, 
because we have two ways we can multiply vectors together, right? We did it, we multiplied the dot product using the components over here. Let's go back and use this guy over here, magnitude A, magnitude B, cosine of the angle between them. All right, well, we know that for vector A, the magnitude, look at the drawing, the magnitude of vector A is four, right? And uh, we know that for vector B, the magnitude uh, is equal to three. So if we wanted to calculate the dot product a totally different way, what we would say is magnitude of A, magnitude of B, cosine of the angle between them. Magnitude of A is four, magnitude of B is three, and what is the cosine of the angle between them? The angle between them is literally the angle that is swept between the vectors, but that has to be 90 degrees. And the cosine of 90 degrees is zero. So A dot B is zero. And so we get exactly the same answer, right? If I give you the vector, uh, the vector in unit vector notation and you take the dot product according to this formula, we get an answer of zero. If I convert these vectors to magnitudes and angles, I didn't write the angles down, but, but the, this would be an angle of zero and then this would be an angle of 90 degrees, then magnitude A, magnitude B, cosine of the angle between them gives us exactly the same dot product. So I'm starting to try to unify these two things together, proving to you that they give you the same exact answer. All right, and it makes sense that the dot product is zero. Why? Because there is no projection of this vector onto this one, and so there also is no projection of this one onto this one. There is no projection either way in the direction of the other vector, so the dot product has to be zero. All right, now what I'd like to do is, hmm, I think I will do it over here. I would like to do the same thing, but for a little more complex example, because that example was a little simpler. The dot product was zero. That's okay, we can start there. Let's do another quick example to show you that we calculate the dot product both ways. We get exactly the same answer. Let me give you two vectors. The first vector, A, is 3i uh, plus 2j. And the second vector, which we call B, is i plus 4j. All right. Notice that these vectors are both in the xy plane because they have i and j components but no k components. That's okay. Now how would we calculate the dot product? Without doing any drawing at all, we know that vector A dotted with vector B uh, is going to be this, the, uh, the same thing. It's the x components multiplied, the y components multiplied, the z components multiplied. So I'll just write it out. A x b x, A y b y, A z b z. What does that equal? This is the x component and this is the x component, so it's going to be 3 times 1 because this is a coefficient of 1, coefficient of 3, coefficient of 2 for y, coefficient of 4. And what's the z component? 0. And what's the z component? 0. 0 and 0. All right. And so what do you get? a dot b. This is going to give you 3. This is going to give you 8. And so what you get is 11. Now look how easy that was. Wasn't that really easy? You didn't have to worry about cosines or sines or how much it projects into this or that. I just gave you a vector in unit vector notation. I gave you another vector in unit vector notation. Bingo, bingo. You just found the dot product. Like you didn't have to draw anything. It was literally multiplying the x components together, then multiplying the y components together, then multiplying the z components together, and you add them all up. That's the dot product. But what I want to do is I want to tie it to you a little more closely that the calculation getting this gives you exactly the same thing as if you were to go back and use this here. But in order to use this, we have to know the magnitudes of the vectors, and we also have to know the angles to figure out what the angle between them is. All right, so let's go and do that. And it's going to take a little bit of work, but we'll just, we'll just crank through it. So I'll put a little, a little line here to separate. All right, so what's the magnitude of this vector A? Well, we use the Pythagorean theorem. This is vector A, so it's 3 squared plus 2 squared. This is 9, this is 4, 9 and 4 is 13, so it's the square root of 13, so magnitude of A is, when you take the square root of 13, 3.606. Now, I'm truncating the decimals, all right, but I'm carrying three decimals throughout this. Now, what's the angle of this vector? The angle of this vector is the inverse tangent of the y component divided by the x component, 2 divided by 3. y component divided by x component, so 2 thirds. So if you, uh, if you um, go into a calculator and take 2 divided by 3 and take the inverse tangent, I guess I'll do it maybe down here, then the angle that you get back is going to be 33.690 degrees. 
okay? Now what I wanna do is I wanna go slide right over here and do exactly the same thing for the B vector. We need a magnitude and we need the angle. We need to convert it. So angle or vector B magnitude is the square root of one squared plus four squared. Right? This gives you 16, that gives you one more, so it's 17. Square root of 17 is what we have. And so, magnitude of B vector is 4.123. Now what's the angle? The tangent of the angle of this uh, guy is gonna be the Y divided by X, four divided by one, which of course is one. So whenever you, uh, whenever you, I didn't quite do that right, I apologize. Uh, that was correct, but what I really want to say is the uh, theta is equal to the inverse tangent of 4 divided by 3. Okay, so what I'm trying to say here is that if I take 4 divided by 1, which is 4, inverse tangent in calculator, what you're going to get is uh, 70, let me double check myself, what am I going to get for the angle? It's going to be 75 point, whoops, 964. All right, so all I have done is we calculated the dot product, but then I turned this vector into magnitude and angle. I turned this vector into magnitude and angle, which we know how to do, right? Let's now calculate the dot product using this information completely independent from that information. We already know that the dot product A dotted with B is gonna be equal to magnitude of A times magnitude of B times cosine of whatever the angle is between the two vectors. Now the magnitude of A is this number, 3.606, and the magnitude of the B vector is 4.123. And the cosine, you gotta be really careful, is not either one of these angles, it is the angle between these vectors. So really, it's gonna be 75.964, subtract this angle, 33.690. All right, I'm gonna draw you a picture in just a second to show you how that's the case, but let's, go, let's continue through the calculation to make sure we get to the end unscathed, right? So what we're gonna have when we take this number multiplied by 4.123 is we're gonna get 14.868. And then it's gonna be multiplied by the cosine of the subtraction of those angles, which is gonna be 42.274. All right, and what we're gonna get is 14 0.868, and then uh, the cosine of 42.274 is 0 0.739, getting to the end here. This times this number gives you A dotted with B of 11.001, and of course, when I took these cosines, I had to truncate decimals, the radicals, I truncated decimals everywhere, so this is close enough to 11 to say that we have verified that we dot, when we take the dot product of these using A, magnitude A, magnitude B, cosine theta, we get 11 as the answer, which is exactly the same thing we get from before. So we know that we have done everything correctly. I'm just trying to prove it to you because a lot of students see that there's two different ways to calculate it and they don't totally put it in their mind that the only reason we have two ways of doing it is because sometimes your vectors are given to you in unit vector notation. Then it's gonna be much easier to do this. Look at how easy this was. But sometimes your vectors are gonna be given to you in magnitude and angles. And so it's gonna be much easier to, to do this, otherwise you'd have to convert it to this first. Now before we go, and, and move on, I'm gonna to try to leave the bottom of this board clean because I need it for the very last part of the lesson. But I'm gonna to try to draw really quickly what we have. So let me kind of draw a little x, y axis right here, and it's gonna be a little crowded, sorry about that, but sometimes you just have to, sometimes you just have to do that. <clears throat> so what we figured out is that vector A is about 3.6, right, at an angle of 33 degrees. So I'm not gonna try to draw the lengths exactly right, So, I'm, but what I will do is I will draw vector A something like this, I'll call it vector A, and this angle is 33.690. Because when we calculate the angle of a vector, it's reference to the x-axis, so that's the angle to the x-axis. Vector B was a little bit longer, so I'll try to draw it longer, and it's a much higher angle. I'll try to draw a little bit longer like this, but the angle of the B vector is 75.964, but that's in reference, again, to the x-axis. So it's right here, that is 75.964. So you see, this vector B is an angle relative to the x-axis. That's why it's bigger than this one, which is an angle, again, relative to the same place. But when I calculate A, B, cosine theta, this theta has to be the, the, the angle between them. And how do you find this angle? Well, it would be this giant angle minus this little piece off. 
that's going to be the angle between them. That's why when I took the cosine, I subtracted the numbers. So you have to, when you take a, b, cosine, theta, you must find the angle between the vectors. You can't just throw an angle in there and get the right answer. It has to be the angle between the vectors. All right, so we've done basically everything that I want to accomplish in order for you to solve problems. But there's one last thing that I really wanted to do that bugged me big time when I learned this the first time. I did not, for the life of me, understand why this is the same as this. I mean, we calculate it both ways and we see that it's the same thing. But why is it that doing this thing equals this? That is what I want to address here. You probably don't have to watch it, but believe me, I wouldn't waste my time doing it if I didn't think it was a good idea. All right. So here is how we're going to handle that. Let me get to the right page where I proved this a few minutes ago. And what I want to do is I want to... Hmm, how do I want to do this? I want to remind you that a dot b is equal to uh, magnitude of a, magnitude of b times cosine of the angle between them. This is true of any vectors pointed anywhere. Okay, um, And then I want to write down what we are doing in this other case. So a dotted with b. And what we're saying when we have a dotted with b, I'm telling you that the end result the end result is this, but forget about the end result. I want to prove to you that that end result is true. What is vector A? Vector A is the following. It is some component in the x direction attached to a unit vector in the i direction, plus some component in the y direction, j, plus some component in the z direction, k. This is what the A vector is. It's some number in front of i hat plus some number in front of j hat plus some number in front of k hat. That's what this is. It could be like 3i plus 2j minus 5k, right? But we're dotting it, so we put the mathematical operation of a dot here, and we have a b vector, which we also need to represent the same way. We have an x component in the i direction, we have a y component in the j direction, and we have a z component in the k direction. So we have established that we have an a vector dotted with a b vector, and we just wrote out the a and the b vector. Now in physics, usually, we're working in the xy plane, so there is no z component, really, but I'm putting it there to be the most general. But a lot of times we don't even have a z component, so everything is even simpler than what it is here. What you need to realize to understand the trick of this whole thing is that this operates just like FOIL, or I shouldn't say FOIL, just like multiplying uh, uh, expressions in algebra. The way that we, uh, the way that we do this is this uh, term gets multiply, I should say, operates on this one, and then it goes and operates on this one, and then this one gets applied in and operates on the third one. So it's going to generate three terms, and then this one will do the same thing to each of the three, and then this one will do the same thing to each of the three. Now, it's going to generate a lot of writing, okay? And I'm going to apologize in advance if I make an error, because there's a lot of writing. But at the end of the day, after I do all the writing, then Almost all the terms are going to disappear except for the ones that are over there on the board that we know the final answer is. And so when we take these two things and dot them together, all of these other terms are going to drop away except for what I've already told you is the final answer. That is going to be the end up being the proof of what's going on here. Now, how do we do this? What we're saying is that, is that what we have is this kind of like it's it's dotted with this. So it's like this term dotted with this. Now the numbers in front get multiplied, but the, this is a unit vector. It's a vector. And it gets dotted with the other vector. So when you apply and operate this on this, what you get is ax multiplied by bx. But the i that comes from here gets dotted with a dot product over here to the i over here. Make sure you understand that. When this dots in th with this, the numbers uh, multiply together, but the vector portion of it uh, gets uh, dotted with each other. This is the same thing as if this were 2x and if this were 3x, then you would multiply 2 times 3 and you would get 6, and x times x would get x squared. But it's not x, it's a unit vector. So we can't just multiply them, we have to treat them as vector dot product because that's the operation happening. The coefficients get multiplied, the vectors get dotted. Now we have these two over here. This is ax, by, and they're added together. A -X, a -X b, y, and then i dot j. And then we have a, x, b, z. And then we have i dot k. Now you might want to pause the video if you don't get it 
up to this point, because once you understand this line, the rest of it naturally follows. This operates on this, generating this. This operates on this, generating this. This operates on this, generating this. And so in each case, you're taking AX, and you have BX, BY, BZ. B, uh, you have B, uh, BX here, BY here, and BZ here. And then you have the I dot I here, the I dot J here, and then the I dot K here. All right, so let's go down below. I'm going to add to it. Now we could erase these red ones here and say that this operates on this, and then this operates on this, and then this operates on this. So we put our fingers here. It's A, Y, B, X. A, Y, B, X. And then it's J dot I. Right? And then we add A, Y, B, Y. A, Y, B, Y. And then J dot J. Right? And then A, Y, B, Z. And then uh, we have J dot K. Okay? It's easy to make a mistake with this, right? Now we're going to add the third line. Now we have to multiply this times each of the three terms. So A, Z, B, X. A, Z, B, X. And then it's K dot I. I promise we're almost done. Then A, Z, B, Y. A, Z, B, Y, and then K dot J. Okay? And then we finally have A, Z, B, Z, and then we have K dot K. Now, at this point, you should be saying, why is this guy writing all this stuff down? Because I have to prove to you from first principles how to simplify something. You're not going to do this for probably any problem you solve but I'm trying to show you where that formula comes from. And the, what we did is we said, well, A vector in general can be written like this. B vector can in general be written like this. It's a math problem. We have to cross multiply each term. However, the multiplication is a dot product. So every time we do it, the numbers get multiplied, the vectors get dotted. Now here is where the magic happens. I'm gonna slide over here to another board. I'm gonna pull that away for just a second. And I'm gonna draw an X, Y, Z coordinate system. So this is X. This is y, and this is z. Now remember what a unit vector is. A unit vector is a, a vector of length 1 in, along each of the direction of the coordinate axis, right? So in the x direction, it was the i hat unit vector. In the y direction, it was the j hat unit vector. And in the k z direction, it was the k hat unit vector. So these red things are just vectors in those directions of length 1. I could draw a number 1 here, but it would clutter the diagram. Each of the lengths are length 1. So if I just asked you randomly to look at this drawing, and if I said, hey, what is the vector i dotted with the vector i? Because we need to know that to, to do anything over here. What would you say? You would say, well, okay, it's the magnitude of the first vector times the magnitude of the second vector times the cosine of the angle between them. Why would you say that? Because the definition of the dot product, any dot product, is the magnitude of the first vector times the magnitude of the second vector times the cosine of the angle between them. When we say something like i dot i, don't get scared off that these, this i hat has a weird hat. It's just a vector. It's a vector of length 1 pointed in a known direction, the x direction. So if I know that it's just a vector of length 1, then I do magnitude of this times magnitude of this. That's just 1 times 1. And then the cosine, what is the cosine of the angle between them? Well, if I have two unit vectors, both of them i pointed in the same direction, the angle between them is 0. And we know that the cosine of 0 is 1. So 1 times 1 times 1 means that i dot with i is equal to 1. You might say, who cares? All right, let's do the same thing with j dot j. You're going to get exactly the same thing, right? Because it's going to be the magnitude of this times the magnitude of this. That's going to be 1 times 1 times the cosine of the angle between them. But again, if you have two vectors in the j direction, the angle between them is 0. So you're going to get, again, 1. And if you do the same thing with the k direction, k dot k, you're again going to get 1 because the magnitude of this is 1 times the magnitude of this, which is 1, times the cosine of 0, because they're both in the same direction, is 1. So anytime the unit vectors are the same, i dot i, j dot j, k dot k, then the answer is 1. Now let's go back to what we were doing. Here we have an i dot i, so we know that this is just going to be 1. Here we have a j dot j. We know that this is going to be 1. Here we have a k dot k. We know that this is just going to be 1. 
Now, these are all the cases where it's the same unit vector dotted with itself. In all the other cases, the unit vectors are different. And you're like, oh my gosh, my head is spinning. Okay, well, let's look at it. What would be, just as one example, I dotted with J? This would be a unit vector in the X direction dotted with a unit vector in the Y direction. Well, you would say magnitude of this times magnitude of this times the cosine. What is the cosine between these guys? Well, this is in a plane, and you know it's an x, y, z plane. So this is a 90 degree angle in the, between the x and the y axis. So this is 90 degrees. And the cosine of 90 is zero. And so this whole thing becomes equal to zero. And by extension, anytime they're different, just pick any other two. Let's do k dotted with j. Anytime they're different, it's going to be the magnitude of this, which is 1, times the magnitude of this, which is 1, and then k dot j, that's again 90 degrees. Cosine of 90 degrees is 0, and so the answer you're going to get is 0. So anytime, anytime the unit vectors are dotted with each other and they're different, anytime they're different, then the answer will always be 0. Because we already explored a minute ago, I told you that when any two vectors are 90 degrees from each other, you're always going to get a dot product of 0. So anytime the unit vectors are different in the coordinate system, they're always going to give you an answer of 0. And so this is the fun part. i dot j, well, we know it's 0. i dot k, we know it's 0. This one has to be 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 0. And what have we proven? That a dot b, what's left? Well, ax bx times 1, ax bx, uh, this is all 0. This is 0. Then we have ay by times 1, ay by times 1. So we, that drops away. 0, 0, 0, and then az bz, again, times 1. This is what we proved. This is what we set out to prove. So the, the dot product, when everything is given to you as a unit vector, is just the x components multiplied together, then the y components multiplied together, then the z components multiplied together, and then we add them all up. That's what I wrote down in the very beginning of the lesson. I just did it without proving it to you, because when we teach a lesson, we have to start somewhere. We have to, I have to give you something and say, this is what it is, please believe me, okay? But then I slowly build the case to prove it to you. And this is why the lesson had to be so long, because if I cut the proof out to another part, then you wouldn't connect it. So let's take it very quickly from the top, and we're actually done with this lesson. So we introduced the concept of a dot product, it's one way of multiplying vectors where you get a scalar result. There's two ways to calculate it. If you're given the vectors in magnitude angle uh, information, it's the magnitude of vector A times the magnitude of vector B times the cosine of the angle between them. But if you're given them in unit vector notation, then you multiply the x components, the y components, and the z components, and you add them all together, you get the same exact answer either way. Physically, what does it mean when you take a dot b? It says, how much of this vector a exists in the direction of b? Take that length, multiply by the length of the other vector, which means a cosine theta times the other vector, and so you get a b cosine theta. If you flip it around to do b times a, it's the same thing. It's the how much of b vector exists in the a direction, that's what we multiply by the other vector, get the same thing. So if we take a dot b and b dot a, flip it around, we get the same answer. Okay, then we did a problem. I gave you two vectors, I gave you the included angle, and we calculated the dot product. We drew a little picture to show that it was like the projection, how much of this exists in the other direction, then times the other vector, and that's the answer that we got. And then we talked about physically what is a dot product for. The most common one that you're going to use early on in physics is for the definition of work. When you learn about work as a very, you know, uh, as an algebra-based class, typically uh, we just assume the force uh, is lined up in the same direction as the distance the object moves, and it's force times distance. But what if the force acts at an angle? Then we want to know how much of the force exists in the direction of motion, so we cut it down with f cosine theta. That's how much is in that direction multiplied by d. So it becomes fd cosine theta, which is the same as f dotted with d. This is the formula that you will see in you know, a calculus-based physics class. Then we talked about special cases. We said, well, if the vectors are lined up exactly, then there's no angle between them. It's the maximum dot product where the both of the vector lengths are multiplied together. But if the uh, angle between them is 90 degrees, then you're going to get a dot product of zero because there is no projection onto the other vector. And any angle between them is going to vary between zero and the maximum that you can get if they're lined up already together. 
And then we uh, did some problems. We did a simple problem where one vector lied on the y-axis and the other vector li uh, lied on the x-axis. We wrote them down, we calculated using the unit vector way of calculating the dot product. We got an, an answer of zero because of course they're 90 degrees and there's no projection onto the other um, vector. And then we converted this to magnitude uh, uh, information and used the AB cosine theta, but the angle theta between them was 90, and when we did it, we got the same dot product of zero, showing that they give the same answer. And then we transitioned to doing a more complex problem, uh, where we had two different vectors that were not on an axis. We calculated their dot product in unit vector notation, multiplied the x components, multiplied the y components, multiplied the z components, add them up, dot product is 11. All right, let's do it again. The magnitude of vector A was this, the angle was this. The magnitude of vector B was this, the angle was this. The picture of that is two different angles of vectors. We can find the dot product as AB cosine theta. We write magnitude of A, magnitude of B, cosine of the difference to find the angle between them. And what do you know? We get exactly the same dot product. So again, proving that we get the same dot product no matter how we calculate it. Then we wanted to prove something. We wanted to say, why is it that that formula works anyway? So we take a vector A and a vector B and we write them out in terms of unit vectors and we uh, we basically distribute in, just like a distributive property, but it's a, over a dot product. So it's not multiplication, it's dotted. That means we multiply the numbers, dot the vectors. When we cross dot everything all over the place, and then we go and look at an XYZ system, anytime you dot unit vectors that are the same, we always get an answer of one because they're already lined up. And anytime we dot two vectors that are different, we always get a dot product of zero. And so when we go back here and apply that, we see that all of the dot products on all these unit vectors are zero except when they're the same. So when they drop away giving us one and these drop away giving us zero, we arrive at exactly the equation that we started with. So, huh, that's a lot of talking, but it's really important. Believe me, it would have been easier to cut this into two or three lessons, but then you would have been left, you would have been left confused, I, I really believe, because I could have explained the the, the picture concept of what the dot product was, but then you wouldn't have any experience solving anything. Or if I put those together and didn't prove anything, then you would know how to do it, but then you wouldn't know why it worked. You wouldn't know why the dot product in component form gave you the same answer because you, you, you wouldn't have gotten that far. And of course you can watch the lessons back to back, but if you don't do that, then you, know, then you lose a lot of what I'm trying to convey to you. So now that we have the basics under our belt, now that we know how to dot vectors into each other, the next two lessons are simple because we just apply what we've learned. And after we do that, we then tackle the cross product, which is also called the vector product uh, in the last couple of lessons. So I'd like you to watch this lesson at least two times. It took a long time to write, a long time to, to teach it. I think you should watch it probably twice. Solve everything yourself. Even this little, I know it seems like you don't want to do this, but I really, really do think you should do it. Believe me, I wouldn't, I don't like doing that. It's so much writing, but I think you should do it. It will really help you understand what's happening. All right, then after that, follow me on to the next lesson. We'll continue conquering the dot product. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.